Revolutionaries under Fidel Castro would take the same name. You know, it's a pretty clever name, you know, Cuba, Liberty, Liberty for Cuba. It was kind of this hodgepodge of groups in 59, just like it was then. And, oh, who would become the first provisional governor of Hawaii? I had a banana from his cor the corporation that would take his name. Yeah. Now, check it. Was, I thought it was Chiquita. It was Dole. One of the few companies that controls that trade. Do we get to the Philippines? Okay, so this shows that this war was so, I mean, it was about territory. It's about empire, without a doubt. And then he'd go off and start his own regiment. And so let's get to what happened here. And so it just took a few days to sail from Hong Kong to Manila Bay, surprising the Filipino or the, uh, the Spaniards who are fighting a Filipino insurrection at that time. But Filipinos who desperately want independence. And the Philippines is a massive archipelago. There's over a thousand islands. You're, most are not that big, but millions of people. It's a big place. And when they arrived, there were parody in ships. Both sides had about 16, but the Spanish ships were still wooden framed iron armor. United States ships were steel, modern, fast. The Spanish weapons were still half of them were black powder. The United States weapons had modern guns, rifled barrels, cordite. In fact, the eight inch guns and the 10 inch guns on the Hartford, which was Commodore Dewey's flagship, they could fire about 10 miles. Now, the problem is they haven't trained for anything longer than 500 yards. 99% of the shots the US Navy fired missed. They're just, they had no idea. They had not learned how to aim. They're literally going to have to learn how to aim at something that's almost at the edge of the horizon. But they sailed in, and I know you wanted to see Commodore Dewey at, at the, um, on the bridge of the ship. Are you ready? So there's Dewey ready to fight. So I tapped in Dewey, and it came up Mickey Rath. So I figured I'd show you Mickey Rath. There's Dewey right there. He's going to become the first hero of the war. And the battle was not even close. Spanish black powder weapons bounced off U.S. steel armor. The Navy was destroyed. So the Spanish, they still had soldiers there, the colonial soldiers. But they basically were done. In fact, Filipino insurrectionists, Filipino revolutionaries would take over the Manila. And, and they believed that the United States was there to liberate them. Boy, would they be mistaken. Then the United States is going to have to organize forces and sail. It'll take, it'll take a few months for them to get across the Pacific. So Dewey's fleet is there. They're going to write songs about Dewey. This was the golden age of sheet music. You know, people would buy music mostly for piano. Just all these songs. And these songwriters would make all these. Just, just fire them out. So there's a bunch of songs about Dewey. And most of them are just horrible. But just they fire them out. And... Well, the United States, we had this on the quiz. When Congress was passing the first appropriations or spending bill, an amendment was added called the Teller Amendment. And it wanted to show, because a lot of the people who voted for the war said, well, we don't want this to be a war of conquest. We're not an imperial power. So to say that, it said that Cuba would be independent. And this cartoon is another one of these. And I'm doing this on purpose because we have to see the contrast. So here's justifying coming in and rescuing. Here's the U.S. rescuing Cuba from evil Spain. But remember, you know, dark, the villain in black, in white, colors that came, you know, that idea of good, civilizes white. And look at Cuba and look at her face, the damsel in distress. So it's supposed to represent like a plague. Of Remember that face. But it never actually said what independence was. What is independence? More importantly, who is going to define independence for Cuba? The United States government. And so it never is clear on that. And secondly, what about those other areas? The Philippines, Puerto Rico, Guam. They're not mentioned. 
If the United States is looking westward across the Pacific, the Philippines is the prize. Not only for a market, it's a huge island, but it's right next to China. A U.S. naval base there to protect the Chinese trade. In fact, the United States, um, it left Cuba, or left the Philippines kicked the U.S. out in 1982, in the independent Philippines, but now we're back. And we are uh, now going to be in the six base U.S. forces in the Philippines because of China. Right now, imperialism, we're now all over the world. It's a different world after this war. And so here's another cartoon. And I wanted to show these pictures. I'm doing it for a reason. People, Spain, Spanish soldiers wore white cotton uniforms and straw hats. Actually pretty nice and warm weather. I know you're thinking white, no camouflage. No one even thought about camouflage. Modern rifles were so new that nobody thought about having to hide from somebody at more than 30 yards away. They can't hit me. How far can a modern rifle smoke this powder? You start seeing them being developed in the 1880s. How far can a rifle fire? Say 30 caliber fire. How far that can fire? You go like this and fire it. You're not going to hit where you're aiming at, but the bullet can go over. It's going to be after this war and when the British fight in the World War, they start fought that with red uniforms. You see, right after these wars, Sherman's going to go to like Then eventually, more camouflage. But here they are hiding. And you notice they're dark in the shadows, fearing. Here's the United States defending Cuba. Now, some of these protections, she can't defend herself. But look at the face, look at the features. This is important. This is the justify going in to save them, humanitarianism. So the U.S. Army had only 28,000, in fact, the total military, 28,000 men, the tiny military. And most of the men were still spread out on forts all across the West. Just a tiny little military. But within a month and a half, there'll be 250,000 men, National Guardsmen, and all these volunteers. Every state got quoted, you must have this many volunteers. They, they accidentally doubled Montana's quota. So Montana sent a disproportionately large number of troops, a lot of Montanans. Most of them would not go to Cuba. They'd be sent to Seattle or San Francisco than across the Philippines. And this shows the regular forces. So no one had helmets. Helmets are World War I thing. But blue cap, and they're going to cotton, but most of the U.S. soldiers are still wearing Civil War era uniforms, light blue, navy blue, and made out of what? You remember what Civil War uniforms were made out of? And as we all know, wool is perfect for, for climates like Cuba or the Philippines. It keeps the heat out, right? That's science. It's a matter of simple physics. We have modern, very good bolt action rifles. Except for one problem rifles would jam in human climates. Not a problem here. The Spanish actually had much better weapons German Mauser rifles. And the United States did not have machine guns, the new Maxims. They were still using 1870 era Gatling guns that still fired black powder, still used black powder, but they fired a 57 caliber bullet. If you know anything about bullets, 57 caliber is a massive on the left. And it could just rip things apart if it's so heavy. But the Spanish were actually better armed. But their men were all conscripted or draftees. They were unmotivated. They didn't want to be there. They were poorly led. And so the U.S. had that advantage of just, yeah, just gung-ho. So the first soldiers that would arrive, regular army soldiers, and they were black soldiers. You remember I told you about their, they trained these, they called them colored regiments, but for putting down unions. Montana had two and a half regiments of black soldiers. So these are soldiers actually probably from the Zulu. And they sent them down because they thought soldiers of African descent would be less likely to catch yellow feet. That's completely false. So that was that weird kind of new biological, racialized biological science that was not very true at all. 
What were the laws that segregated the South? Do you remember those laws? What were they called? Say it again. Yeah, the Jim Crow laws. They're in Tampa. Well, black soldiers, I mean, there were restrictions in the North too, but they just assumed when they got there were soldiers, this war that everyone's talking about, we're going to be treated relatively legally. So when they got passes or leave that month, they were in Tampa waiting to go. They just assumed they could go out to the the big thing wanted to go to bars. And no, oh, these were segregated. They would not be allowed in and some were arrested. Well, they resisted, and this is going to trigger a fight. It's, these are going to be dubbed, one well, the first one they're going to dub a race riot. So color of skin. But what happened was a bunch of the police in Tampa, along with other whites, grabbing various weapons, started attacking black soldiers on the, on the streets. Black soldiers resisted. You can imagine who's going to get in trouble for this. At least a dozen black soldiers would be court-martialed and sentenced to hard labor for being attacked. And this shows so many of the contradictions in the United States with Jim Crow laws. And I'm mentioning this here, the same kind of thing's going to happen even bigger in World War I and even bigger in World War II, because Jim Crow laws will still be going on. I do like this one. He's actually a cornet, but I, I think that's pretty cool. So, Teddy Roosevelt left the Navy Department and he started his own regiment. And these are volunteers, so they call the U.S. Army Volunteers, and they're going to be dubbed the Rough Riders. Teddy Roosevelt was really popular. He was already this up and coming uh, reform, progressive reformer from New York, then Undersecretary of the Navy. He was entertaining. So all these reporters followed him and talked the whole, put it in newspapers all over the country about Roosevelt recruiting um, the sons of wealthy men in, in New York City and cowboys from the plains who would fight together in this regiment. And soon this would become, well, actually the myth would be much bigger than the reality. So if you type in Teddy Roosevelt into the Google machine, you will find Pictures like this all the time. And I didn't put this up. In buckskin, riding, charging up. And in fact, it was always San Juan Hill charging up. And why did everyone know? Because he had reporters telling everything he did. Actually, no, here they are. They dressed, they were in the same uniforms everybody else was wearing. And the myth is almost completely untrue. Yet he, yes, he did fight. But it was great propaganda for him. Think about it. every day, Teddy Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. He got back and immediately announced he's going to run for governor of New York, swept right in. And in less than three years after that, he's the Republican nominee for vice president. Less than two years. Less than three years, he's president of the United States. It's amazing how fast it happened. So, after a couple months of organizing troops, these untrained volunteers kind of poured in. Remember the Maine? They're all screaming. They're at Tampa, really nice harbor in Tampa. There's only really two cities of any size in Florida this time. Jacksonville, but that was pretty swampy and hot, and Tampa was a harbor. Florida was small. Air conditioning, the change of everything. To now Florida it is. Florida, that thing we call Florida. Well, the plan was simple. Blockade it. Spain is across the Atlantic. They can't really do much. And their fleet is too small. It, Spain is, it doesn't have a chance, really. Their small fleet is in Santiago. If the United States can take Santiago, they will have no choice but to surrender. Whether right here is this kind of Swampy area called Guantanamo. That's coming up down the road. And the plan was this is the West Point map. So there's Santiago, just blockade it, land a little bit east, and go this way. Well, the United States Army had not fought any large actions in the Civil War. So none of the people commanding had commanded anything larger than a regiment. So less than a thousand men, usually less than 500 men. So they had no experience with it. They had no experience in amphibious landings from the sea. They had no idea what they're doing. They just threw stuff on ships. They left gear. They left stuff behind. 
no planning at all. When they actually landed here, it was a disaster. Fortunately, the Spanish were not defending here. The Spanish were in these hills around Santiago. The Spanish soldiers basically did not want to leave their forts. They didn't want to fight. It was awful. They lost gear. They didn't have enough boats. They didn't have enough ammunition. They loaded the ships all pell-mell, just threw everything in. In fact, they loaded the ammunition on the bottom for ballast. But that's the first thing you're going to need. The first thing you need is the last thing you load. And they weren't even thinking. They didn't bring enough boats, and they didn't have enough freighters anyway, so the cavalry didn't have horses. The only horses and mules they brought were for wagons and for cannon. So Teddy Roosevelt, and those dramatic pictures of him on horseback, no, they walked. They didn't have horses. And when they got there, they didn't have enough boats to get the horses from the boats, from the freighters, to the coast. So they had a man go to shore with a bugle and start blowing it. And a few of the horses had been in the army a while, so they they had been long enough to go to the sound of the bugle. And they hoped the horses they just bought would follow. And so they just pushed them overboard and let them swim in the ocean too. And about two thirds decided to swim north. He decided to go south and go to Venezuela. I'm sorry, they didn't. They're still going today. So the point is disaster. And so there was one fight here, but the fights are going to be over the hills. And actually, Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders fought Grave Hill, Canny, and Kettle Hill. But the, the most important hill was San Juan Hill. Oh, those are, uh, they didn't have enough backpacks, so they had to wrap their gear in the blanket. These soldiers right there. Still in blue, uncomfortable, hot. Well, San Juan Hill had a stone wall, a citadel, a fort on top, and the plan was to take it by storm. And this is something that the Gatling guns really were effective. They wheeled them up close, put them in pits or with um, ducks and girdle on to give them a little protection. And the Gatling guns just aimed at the rocks that the Spanish were hiding behind. The big bullets hit the rock, and what did the rocks do? Splintered in their face. Can you imagine getting your eyes, your mouth, hitting it like that, cutting it up? A lot of the Spanish soldiers didn't want to be there. Bang, got hit like, good luck. They took off like And so the defenses began to break down, and then two regiments charged up the hill. Now, Teddy Roosevelt's going to take credit for this. He said that I saw the men failing, and I ran over from Kettle Hill, waving my sword, and charged up the hill, and they followed. He did kind of join in late. But this contemporary watercolor shows you something. This is actually who fought for the hill. There were two regiments of colored soldiers. One, they call it colored regiments of black soldiers. One of the regiments from Missoula. One from Missoula. They took the hill and got no credit in one. Teddy Roosevelt got the credit and therefore the rubber. So to this day, they talk about Teddy Roosevelt taking. Yeah, the Spaniards had no desire. After a few rounds, they just took off. Here's a postcard. Postcards became the rage in the 1890s. And so here's a postcard you could get of the blown apart citadel after the battle. And it was black and white, and they hand painted a little bit to make it look more realistic. And you, you know, postcards were like, wow, these are great. And so <laughs> the war ended, but now we have Thomas Edison in his motion picture camera. And his new movie studio in New Jersey, he started reproducing the war, reproduced the Battle of Manila Bay, reproduced the battle. This is actually the Alcani, but one of the hills that the Rough Riders took. And so here's a charge, and they would show these in vaudeville houses. So let me show you the Rough Riders going up, charging up a hill. So they would show this, they play a piano in the background, and the crowds love these films. And this kind of realism, you can see why. You're not going to believe this was filmed in 1899. You're going to feel like you were actually in Cuba at the battle. Play. There we go. Does that look like Cuba? 
Look at that hill. And here's the charge. So when they fired these blanks, I guess in the when they watch it in the in the theaters, like ah! and then here's the uh, on horseback, and then I like the one guy on horse, and then repeat. Pretty amazing, isn't it? When they did the uh, Battle of Manila Bay, they just had like wooden ships with firecrackers just floating around. So here's another shot. There's another fight during this war. The Library of Congress, fortunately, has saved all these things. So they have a whole library. And this one, another mid. Oh, no, it's Cat's Box. This is also from 1899. And as we all know, what's the problem with Cat's Boxing? They never keep their left up. When you box, you keep your left up, right? You have to do boxing. If I'm gone, that's what we'll do. We'll do boxing day. Poor kitty. Now, Secretary of State Hay would say a splendid little war. Of course, he wasn't one of the ones dying. So this is gonna be part one of the war. I don't want you, you don't need to write the numbers. What I want you to write down is this, or make sure you get it. more people died at the seats than at Fort Bowery. 800 would be wounded, over 15,000 would be ill. But look at that, over 2,000 died at the seats. Yellow fever was the biggest killer, but malaria too. But it wasn't just that, they're weakened by something else. I should add though, isn't it great where people who don't have to die and go through the suffering of the soldiers, even if they were killed, how difficult it was. There was a splendid little war. I feel so good about myself, allowing other people to go. It's gonna get much worse, much worse, but not quite yet. Now, of these deaths though, part of the problem was, so many of the soldiers were already ill. This is the first fight where you're going to get a massive wave of food poisoning. Now, there's always been food poisoning in war. Sit with all, we get um, food, but preserved food. This is the first war where you have large amounts of processed canned food. The new canneries, the new industrial uh, process of the slaughterhouses and the canneries taking that meat or whatever it might be and processing it in some way, cooking and getting it to the soldiers, or, or cooking it and getting it to the soldiers. But one of the problems were that they soldered the cans with lead. Now they knew lead was bad. And we're only learning in the last 20 or 30 years how horrifically bad lead is. It's much worse than we thought. And, it, and they knew it was bad then, but you know, it got the cans out. But the other problem is, so here are men in line to get some of this canned food that's prepared for them. The problem with canned food or any processed food, what goes into the can? You don't know. It could be anything. And you notice virtually anything you get from a can or any processed food, it's covered with something. Gravy or some kind of thing on it so you can't see or food colorings you can't see. Everything you eat that's processed. And you don't know what it's going in. All of us know that if you've ever looked at, let's say you eat Shields, and you look at the ingredients and go, wow, or any other product. Hmm, this, I'm worried about this. I'm going to keep eating them, but I'm worried about this. Haven't all of us done that? Looked at the ingredients and said, and then keep eating. Right? So we don't know. Does it, we're not even talking good or bad. They don't know. So when the war began, all these packing houses had all this meat that had been laying there since 1893 when the panic began. Demand dropped. So they're taking this meat and don't think about like meat in nice freezers. No, just piles of meat and whatever else comes from pigs or cows or whatever, just stuff. And they threw it down in the basement and they just let it sit there. The basement, you know, probably put dirt floors, whatever. It's all sitting there and stuff be crawling all over it but slowly rotting and petrifying down in the basement. Then when the war began, they needed food and food now. So these packing plants went and got all these orders for canned food. And they went down there with shovels, shoveled it into the hopper, ground it up, add gravy, and that's what they were eating. And so the food might or might not be cooked. Nobody had any idea what was in it. It could be spoiled. It's just this mishmash of stuff 
And then they dump gravy with borax, which is kind of a cleaner, but the borax disguised the snow. And so that's what they gave soldiers. This was for profit. They could make a lot of money quick. So you have all these soldiers getting really ill. I'll give you an example, an American National Guard from Montana, National Guardsman at San Diego, Santiago, right to the Spanish equipment. They get canned food for rations, open it up, stick a spoon in it, spoon into a bully beef. Bully beef, think about like a hard um, stringy meat soup. Out of gravy, it's a brown gravy. Have you noticed everything in plasma is gravy? Okay. Dug it out. Anybody want to guess what he found? Heard a click, dug it out of the can. A horseshoe. So what does that tell you? They should ground up the whole hook. Don't you agree? When you eat books, you want the whole thing, no, nails and all. So clearly, I was about ready to say that's not B. That eh, could be part B, part of the part, part crap. You know, whatever's, whatever's floating around. Hey, if you're going to have a pile of meat in a basement, it's going to be covered with rats. You don't think about rats. You can't keep rats out. Rats will get into anything. If you're not sure, just go into a basement of any place in New York City. Or look at any garbage bag in New York City. Spoil them with rats. Mm. That'd be a good field trip, wouldn't it? We count the rats. But what it meant is they're just using whatever and call them. And they cover it with gravy. So people are getting sick. This is the first time that they're eating it every meal. So you might get a canned meat occasionally, and sometimes you know, people get processed food and feel a little bit ill. Drop the flu is a food poison. They weren't sure. But when they ate it every meal. That's when they were constantly sick and maybe die from that or be more susceptible to the other feet. It's no coincidence that this will become an issue going in the next century. So with that, I know what you're thinking, but let's look at more processed food. Hmm, spam cakes. Now spam, that's not processed food, food at all. Okay, it's baked meat with lots of salt and salty gelatin. Did I add that has salt? It has salt. I know all of you really like Spam, right? And so I said we might have a good day on croissants or something. No, I'm thinking Spam. Huh? Yeah, but now it's wrapped in Spam with some big yellow thin in it. Mm hmm. Well, I don't know. It could be cheese. It's yellow. It could be Velveeta. That's big uh, petroleum based cheese. Who's now? I know what you're thinking. You at all lunch is a little bit late and you're hungry. Doesn't this help? Who has spam for lunch? Okay, moving on. So 1898, the Treaty of Paris. We'll come back to the food issue. 1898, the Treaty of Paris. And the decision was that Cuba would be independent. But would it be? Down the road. And we'll figure it out. The United States, we get Puerto Rico and Guam. Poor Guam had no idea. The Spanish uh, colonial government there was just surprised by U.S. Navy ships. Yeah. What? We're at war? And then the Philippines. And then the United States would pay $20 million for the Philippines. Do you remember the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago that ended the Mexican War? The United States paid for this. So the United States could claim it's not a war for conquest. Same thing here. We're trying to claim we did not conquer the Philippines. We bought it. We bought the claim and the colony from Spain. And 20 million then was a steal. Of course, a steal for the amount of the value, but it's also for colonies to conquer the land. There's a treaty being signed. Remember, they're all made of Paris. Yeah, have you caught it? Have you caught it? <laughs> did you catch it? How many people didn't catch it because your eyes just adjusted to Spain? They just, it was close enough. Did you write down spam? Yes. <laughs> the United States paid Spain. Yes, I was having fun and put spam. So with that, so the United States signed this, but now the treaty ratification, two thirds of the Senate's got to vote for this. And this is going to be a battle. And you're going to see a lot of fights for and against the treaty. Because if the United States signs this treaty, the United States is going to be a different country forever. 
We are now an empire after this, if it's signed. And empires mean war, army, secret police, everything's different. Doesn't mean that wouldn't have happened without this, but obviously this is the moment it did happen. So here's a cartoon fourth, and this is July 4th, right after Hawaii's annexed and the Philippines. And hurrah, we're all together. And look at the faces of Cuba, the Philippines, and they lump Hawaii in there. Look how they draw. That isn't the damsel in distress like those other ones. Look at the faces. Isn't that more like that Queen Lulukwani? Can we let those savages govern themselves? Remember the era. Really important to understand that. Here's another one. And this one is even more stark. But I had to show it. It also has a callback. So there's this is McKinley, like a schoolmaster, like teaching, taught, making it a horrible sacrifice to teach these kids. And look at the kids and look at the faces. Look at the face of Cuba, Hawaii, Philippines, Puerto Rico. Look how they draw the faces. Isn't that just like that picture of Queen Lulu the Kalani? Or going back to those horrible caricatures of Sam. Now these are savages, our little children. How can they govern themselves? And it's more. See the box? Remember I showed you that pear soap of getting out of the water? So have you used it? Find the dirty savages in the sea. It's pretty horrific, but now it's changed from convincing us to go save them to now justify conquering and killing. It's a big shift. It's almost the same justification that would be used to defend slavery, to defend Jim Crow laws, to take American Indian land. So there's going to be a lot of opposition. But the opposition is going to have different reasons for doing this. The anti-imperialist military and their opposition is to the treaty. The big ones of the Philippines. They didn't care so much about Puerto Rico because I was in my backyard. So how's that different than taking Oklahoma? But the Philippines is a big step. That's over the Pacific. And some of the leaders, remember Gompers was the head of the American Federation of Labor. Mark Twain, uh, the most famous author in the United States. Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie he definitely was social Darwinistic, but he immigrated from Scotland. He knew what the English did when they colonized into a Scotland. And William Jennings Bryan. Bryan despised social Darwinism, completely opposed to imperialism. And also Bryan's thinking, this war is really not that poppy. This might push me to the presidency. So they opposed the treaty. Yeah. Good question, and yeah, it would, but Carnegie had just sold his, um, his steel company to a consortium under the bank of J.P. Morgan, a great U.S. Steel. And so, in fact, Carnegie was so close to imperialism, he offered to buy the Philippines for $10 million and let it be for $10 million, which is can't even you know, relate to about 100 million. And they also showed you that Andrew Carnegie had a lot of money to say. But you're going to get, remember I told you, no one is attacking one way or the other. We have, you know, we're, we're a sum of a lot of different things. Like nobody is purely, remember I said left or right or the middle? No, we're all of us. So. Part of the reason was the belief that America was more and more they're using the term self-determination. We should let other places like the Philippines decide their own fate, just as Americans did in Philadelphia with the Declaration of Independence. And what they're saying was, is this goes against the values of the Declaration of Independence. The colonies made their own decision to become independent. We should allow the Philippines or Puerto Rico to do that too. They should decide their own fate. And they're going to make mistakes, but we should let them do it. And that was one of the weird contradictions. Carnegie believed in social Darwinism, but also believed in self-determination. It's just weird how that happens. But that Declaration of Independence. Also, there was a real racist element. You're going to have all these others coming in 
and not just stealing jobs, but are Filipinos going to be American citizens? Are they going to come in and vote? Are we going to allow more of them, others in? What? A lot of racism involved here. Gompers, remember, was the leader of the AFL, and they were, that was a, those unions were mostly, in fact, they were all white male only unions. They feared corporate power. Corporate power and monopolies would take advantage of this, get richer, get sweetheart deals in these foreign places and exploit them, but also get rich off of war. Imperialism equals war, period. That is a truism. Just raw history. We know it in our own history, too. And here is an anti-monopoly one of taking over the world, and there's a worker trying to stop it. And so these were the big reasons. The problem was William Jennings Bryan. Bryan, actually, you could say Bryan, kind of all of these he agreed with. Bryan is thinking 99. And he thought, the war is over. The war is over. We can't go back. So let's just ratify the treaty. I'm going to be known as somebody who's still opposed to this war. And let's move on so I can get elected in 1900. So Bryan's going to drop his opposition. And overnight, it, it basically it gave cover to wavering, mostly Democrats, who opposed it to vote for it. And so the treaty was ratified on a very close vote. Remember, they need two thirds, and so had it just four votes to spend. It was really close. Uh, almost all Republicans voted for it, and then enough Democrats joined. This is a, a cartoon from Judge Magazine, and it's showing Brian then. Brian immediately looked like a hypocrite. Looked like he was spineless. He looked like a, what's an animal I'm looking for? A cowardly lion. That's not familiar. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a direct hit on him. He said one thing, he did something else. Here he is as a jester, but it's also supporting you know, the racist elements of this Chinese and Filipino. So with that, 1901, oh, let's get the last thing. Everyone write down insular cases. Insular cases. And the big argument, all right, we have these areas. Do they have constitutional rights? Does the Constitution follow the flag? Does the Bill of Rights go to the Philippines? And that's right, we'll quit. We'll quit right there. Thank you. 